Hello, John. Hey, George. How are you? I'm frazzled. How are you? Yeah. Uh, I'm, well, I'm a little frazzled. I drove back uh, yesterday from Denver. Uh, back to Santa Fe, which is about 400 and some miles. Jesus! What? Yeah. Oh, well, there was... Uh, I went up to a place called NREL. It's the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's the same place where the Coors, the Coors um, Brewery is. Yeah. <laughs> I once was on a picket line outside of the Coors Brewery. Yeah, I was thinking while I was up there that you had a Colorado connection for a while. I was in Denver in the late 70s, and uh, hmm. and Coors was a real union-busting place. I don't know if it still is, right. but, but back then it had uh, huge union troubles. And um, yeah, I remember when we were asked to boycott Coors beer, which was not exactly a hardship. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but... Uh, but so what? What was? What were you doing at the uh, renewables lab? Oh, I'm working on a on a big article on solar energy. Oh. For National Geographic. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So that was kind of my first stop, and and I decided, you know, it'd be fun to do a road trip. So I drove up on the interstate highway and then um, came back down the mountain route. You know, uh, US 285. Yeah, it's beautiful. Up over the front range. It's beautiful. But we had but it's the first hall. snow of the winter, so it was really icy, and so I wasn't really bargaining for that. So that was a little nerve wracking, but I made it. <laughs> uh huh. Well, well, uh, that's good. Well, I guess the reason I'm frazzled is, well, first of all, Susie uh, just two days ago flew to Tanzania to hmm. um, visit her friend <clears throat> India, who is building a, an orphanage for children there. And um, hmm. and already has something like I don't know I think about twenty uh, children staying with her and um, so Susie oh. is, is going to spend uh, a month there and um, hmm. you know in a way that Susie India does for um, for these children what Susie tries to do for uh, for birds for the birds yeah and uh, this will be a real test of uh, Susie's uh, misanthropy. Um, you know, because Susie thinks there are too many humans on the planet, and oh um, right, yeah. And, and now they're encouraging, encouraging <laughs> the uh, growth of them. Yeah, but she's already oh, written right. an email to say that she safely arrived, and she was just marveling at how beautiful it is, and and how when she and India arrived, all the children and the employees at this orphanage came running up as though she was oh. Princess Diana. Susie said, and uh, they were so. <laughs> Joyful to see her. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, well, this, this should be good for her attitude. Yeah, but this I mean, means, of course, mean that she's wrong. There are too many people on the planet, but you have to, you have to have empathy with those who are already here. Yeah, and um, you know, Jeffrey Sachs dealt with this issue in um, in his most recent book. He said that uh, you know he's talked about how we need to uh, provide better health care for these these really poor people in Africa and he says yeah. that privately um, rarely publicly people come up to him and say well there are too many of them aren't there and uh, if they don't die of malaria or dysentery they're just going to die of starvation later on or in some war and Sachs yeah, says right. actually no uh, what the uh, data show is that when you take care of um, health care and reduce infant mortality uh, that it um, tends to be associated with greater social stability later mm -hmm. on. Uh, and yeah, and probably and more likely to be able to implement some kind of population control. And yes, that population that uh, the birth rates actually see. drop. Um, yeah, when, uh, yeah. There's some kind of it's kind of feedback mechanism. It seems like like you know if your population, whatever whatever creature or animal or plant it is, is endangered. There seems to be some sort of internal mechanism that causes you to reproduce more to make up for it. Yeah, and I mean uh, I have no scientific basis for that, but it sounds <laughs> well. I it think sounds it, true. Well, it's, it's somebody you know, it doesn't have to be some sort of sort of deep unconscious primal urge. It can be just that some of these uh, these adults want to have more children who can take care of them when they're yeah, older, right. or take care of them if they if they get sick with AIDS. 
Yeah, uh, so it so works on a cultural cultural level. Yeah, so they're perfectly rational. Psychological reasons. level. But I wonder sometimes if there's something deeper, and this is... Uh, I've noticed, you know, here in Santa Fe, we have this huge problem with these this invasive species, the Siberian elm tree. Yeah. And, you know, it came from Siberia, and it was um, planted early in the 20th century in, in New Mexico by Easterners coming here that wanted, wanted you know, good old Eastern-type shade trees. And these things were picked because they grow really, really rapidly because they're adapted for Siberia. Right. <laughs> you know, so you bring them to the southwest and they really thrive. But one thing I've noticed is whenever we have a really, really dry um, dry spring, you know, like we're, we're in the worst parts of the drought, these trees will put out vastly more seeds than they, than they do when it's been a, a fairly wet year. It's almost like there's a mechanism that's saying, whoa, you know, we're really endangered as a species and now we need to... Uh, we need to um, proliferate, and it's horrible because every one of these things, like we, each tree, will put out several million seeds. About ninety-nine percent of which seem to be viable, and if you don't pull them up, you'll have nothing but a forest of Siberian elms in your yard. You know, it's interesting because I think that can go the other way with mammals. So, for example, hmm. uh, when um, when female mammals, including humans, um, if they don't have enough uh, body fat, I, they uh, become infertile. I'm I'm pretty sure uh, oh, that's yeah. the case. So so women even start. You know, you've heard that uh, female athletes uh, sometimes stop menstruating uh, right. when they become really lean, and I yeah. think this happens when you are uh, starving as well. So there, it's hmm. a, sort of a natural um, form of uh, birth control instead because obviously you know if they don't have enough resources to take care of themselves they can't take care of offspring either yeah but, so um, you want to you want to contract the population right that's anyway, interesting i just have to look into this so the yeah. reason i'm frazzled but beyond is the, the level of anecdote right <laughs> but but you know so you're frazzled because you're, you've been abandoned basically i'm taking i'm a single for, for an african now. orphanage so this morning i had my kids are in different schools now so mac is in high school and sky is in eighth grade in this other middle school and uh, so I had to ferry both of them to their um, uh, separate schools or actually help them catch uh, the buses oh. and, uh, oh, and then do I do you have a minivan? Uh, no regular buses no. oh yeah, you mean okay. you mean do we d- does my family yeah I like a minivan to you know I was thinking no, we've got something Prius. like Sarah, Sarah Palin the hockey the hockey mom the hockey dad they have a they have a minivan well they've got five kids I guess they need one we just have well, a Prius yeah. that that takes care of uh, uh, that takes care of our needs. But um, yeah. then I have a two-hour commute. Not to complain, but what the hell? Two-hour commute. Yeah. Just to let blogging heads people know the uh, the lengths we go to put on this wonderful show <laughs> every week or a couple of weeks. Yeah, I, r- I rushed back from Golden, Colorado. Yeah, and I, you know, yeah. so I rushed here. I'm at Stevens now. I had a two-hour commute in here, and I'm reading some of this crap that we we're supposedly going to talk about today, of course, which we yeah. haven't gotten to yet. And then as soon as I got here, I had a meeting for the uh, Green Committee at Stevens. We're trying to, we're trying to um, oh, encourage yeah. all the students and faculty to uh, take green issues seriously and revamp the curriculum and make the campus um, reduce the carbon imprint and all that yeah. stuff. And uh, so then I rushed over from that place, which is right across the street from my building, and then I called you, and then, of course, you had this uh, problem with the that stupid problem. camera yeah, that Blogging Head sent you. <laughs> yeah, the zooming thing. It was starting to do what it did with our last show, where it would just suddenly maniacally start zooming in on me, so my you know, like my nose would fill the entire screen. Yeah. You know, and I had talked to Brian, the tech guy, about this, and he said it's been it's apparently something that's going around with this particular camera. And you know, I assumed that he would have a fix, like I needed to download, you know, some flash ROM update or something like that. And he said the only thing that works is to super glue the zoom switch into the <laughs> in, into the left hand position. So I don't know. I just kind of rebelled against taking what you know, this camera that must have cost hundreds of dollars when it came out and super gluing the zoom switch. You know, for one thing, I might. S- you know, it might slip while I'm super gluing and be in the wrong position, and then the camera would be ruined. 
Didn't Plus, you? if I ever wanted to zoom for any reason, I wouldn't be able to do that. Didn't so you I was put trying tape? to fix it. Uh, well, I was headed out with screwdrivers, and I was taking apart different plates, and then finally I popped the, the top of the zoom switch off, and then I pried out the spring with a screwdriver. Yeah. And now it seems to be, be behaving itself, so we'll see. No well, super glue yet. Well, the question, it might be like one of those uh, cases where you knock out a, a gene that you think has only one simple function in a you know a nematode <laughs> right. worm and it and it turns out to uh, you know knock out not only its excretion function but its ability to burrow forward or you know something like yeah. that. So yeah, there's I, all these cross connected circuits. <laughs> so I guess I it's guess. like with old vacuum tube radios, it used to be that if you pulled one of the vacuum tubes out while it was running. Uh huh. It would start sque- making this loud pitch squealing sound, and then you could conclude from that that the purpose of the vacuum, this particular vacuum tube, is a squeal suppressor. <laughs> but actually, of course, it's more complicated than that. Yeah. But anyway, it seems to be working now, so fingers crossed. Well, that's good. So. Um, so yeah, we were going to talk about um, Jonathan Haidt, right? Yeah, moral psychology and politics and all that good stuff. Yeah, I, I, I watched that. Uh, Head video that uh, you recommended, and it was really interesting. I mean, I've heard and read his ideas before and read some of his stuff on edge.org, and, and I think we've talked about him sometime, but it seems really appropriate now with, you know, with the um, campaign scene, scene getting into its, you know, with the campaign winding up and getting nastier and nastier, and this, uh, no, well, why don't you, you summarize what, what Yeah, sure, said. well, so Haidt is somebody. I think it's fair to say he's he is um, doing work in evolutionary psychology and particularly in the evolution of uh, morality. And uh, he says that there's a lot of evidence that um, our uh, values, our um, our moral tendencies, are not completely learned, they're not uh, instilled in us by uh, culture, but are to some extent innate. And, and by the yeah, way... Yeah, and th- he refers to like a rough draft of like a moral structure that, that evolution bequeaths us. Yeah, and, and he says, you know, he's got some of the boilerplate that you get from people in evolutionary psychology, like our good friend Bob Wright and Steve Pinker, and he says mm-hmm. that I, uh, one of the worst ideas that has ever been put forward is is that the that we're born as blank slates and yeah. everything that we are is inscribed uh, on our minds by experience. He says right, that the old John Locke and the, um, the British empiricists. Yep, and he says that this is true uh, not only so. One of the the first really great examples of that um, was uh, that language is innate. So this was. Noam yeah. Chomsky's great thesis, which he advanced, I think, in the 1950s, was pretty much accepted over by the next couple of decades, although I guess it's still debated. But what Haidt and a lot of other people um, have talked about, Bob Wright, uh, Pinker, uh, Mark Hauser uh, has written about this, he's a biologist at Harvard, is that right. um, moral values uh, also are, to some extent, innate, that there's certain core moral Tendencies uh, that you see um, in all cultures, and yeah. uh, uh, you know whether they're very sophisticated um, uh, cultures in, in modern European countries or the United States or uh, tribal societies. And he's got four values that he says um, he thinks are really you know, universal. Five. Or, excuse me, five. Yeah, I made notes. <laughs> yeah, I had to, too. Um, well, so, tell me if I've got these right. So the first one was, uh, I wrote down harm and care. So I guess it's the idea that you instinct- instinctively feel compassion for others who yeah. are uh, suffering. Yeah, like if you walk, if, if somebody, you know, if you walk down the street and someone is, you know, beating beating some poor defenseless puppy or child and... And then you'll probably you'll probably intervene, and if you're too timid to intervene, you'll at least feel you know really bad about it and be shocked. Yeah. So, so that's that, number one, and number two is number fairness two. slash reciprocity. Right. Which yeah, is sort so of summarized that? in the uh, in the golden rule: do unto others as you would have them uh, do unto you. And third, yeah. tit for tat. Right. 
third is in-group loyalty. And uh, so, you know, there are two aspects to this. You are, you know, you've got the back of people within your group, um, and you're very loyal to them, and they, in turn, are loyal to you. But um, you are, uh, you don't show this loyalty to people outside your group, and uh, you may even be hostile towards others outside your group. Right. And actually, Haidt has a great line that when he was talking about in-group loyalty, um, he says that there are lots of different manifestations of tribalism. Some, of course, are um, lethal, and some are are harmless and can be uh, harnessed for entertainment purposes. So sports is an example of that. Right. And Haidt says that sports is to war as pornography is to sex. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was his line, or it seems like something he probably quoted from someone else. Yeah, I can't remember, but um, yeah, so, I mean, you can see how in-group loyalty, how evolutionary pressures would, um, you know, encourage that to become, you know, kind of a wired-in basic basic function, and yet even when it's not necessary, it's, you know, it's still there, so we have, we divide into sports teams or, or gangs or... And it is astonishing how how um, easily that can be invoked in people. I mean, I keep trying not to be a sports fan because it's a total yeah. waste of energy. I know that rationally, but um, I can't help it. So I'm, I'm a huh. diehard Mets fan, and it really causes me much more pain and aggravation than pleasure. Yeah. But I can't help see, it. See, I'm really low on that, on that number three, that in-group loyalty. Well, see, I'm I low... Think, you know, I'm low and so I, I, I've never had any interest whatsoever in sports. And well, what about patriotism? I, mm, I don't know. I guess it bothers me a little, you know, if people say something stereotypically disrespectful about Americans or <laughs> or New Mexicans or people named George or. <laughs> so I suppose a little bit, but one, one thing that really interested me about Haight's um, thesis is that of these five things, he, he, he compared them to little slider switches like on, a, on an audio equalizer, and in different people they're all set at different levels. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, um, and so for my, the number three is, is, is down pretty, pretty, pretty low. Well, the, the thing is, I, I, have, I am sort of an anti-patriot. I, I think that patriotism is... Uh, one of the most destructive values. Um, yeah, nationalism that, in general. That we have. So I am, yeah. you know, I sort of, I do my best to uh, to uh, observe any patriotism welling up in me and try to stamp it out because I think we're, you know, we're all sort of citizens of the human race. But as I said, I, I still get caught up in these stupid tribalisms like, you know, Mets are great yeah. and Yankees. I hate the Yankees. So that's the, you know, in-group out <laughs> thing. And I actually think that... Yeah, see, Mets, I just don't get that. But yeah, it's, it is... Well, you yeah. should. It's stupid. But, yeah. uh, but, it's but on the other hand, I, I, I don't think I would ever vote for a Republican just in principle. Yeah. So I guess I do kind of... Yeah. What about Michael Bloomberg? Well... I don't know. There you go. That's true. And I, I think I did vote for Giuliani when I lived in New York City. And uh, you know we've got so the the Republican this is back when Giuliani seemed like a better guy. Yeah. God, now he's he's impulsive. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, yeah. Let's get that's that, that's three, and then okay. four was um, authority slash respect. So yep. like this ingrained view that um, that it's important to respect authority. And I, I think I'm a little higher. I'm, I'm higher on that, I think, which always kind of surprises me because it doesn't always fit my, you know, my mental image of myself. But yeah, so this can be manifested in family relations, so respect toward your parents or your uh, ancestors, as well as respect toward, uh, you know, elected officials. Uh, I guess even people with fancy college degrees or. Or journalists who yeah. write for places like or, the New York or, Times. Yeah, respect for tradition. Yeah. Or you know, I, I mean, even though it, rationally you know it's there, there's no real reason for the tradition, but you know what the hell? You know, I mean, it's a, if it's not a harmless tradition, it might provide some kind of cohesiveness. So, I, so I can feel that that down down somewhere in my bones. And yeah, maybe <laughs> you have more of that than um, than. Um, 
I do. I sort of, I, I almost have a knee oh, jerk. Oh, totally. I mean, yeah, you're, yeah. I mean, so, you know, ever since you wrote The End of Science. Yeah, I like tweaking. Yeah, so your, your authority respect is like turned down close to zero, right? <laughs> I guess it is. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it yeah, is. Okay, so then number five is purity slash sanctity. Yeah. And this idea that there's virtue in controlling your body, your primal urges, uh, what you put in your body. And this was a, something that struck me that um, Haight said that for conservatives, this is manifested by um, the, uh, by sex, the, the importance of controlling sex and being kind of disgusted by sex. And for liberals, it comes with food. <laughs> Yeah. This idea that it's very important to have these pure organic foods and, um, you know, so, you know, just as irrational in many ways. I mean, there's some scientific basis for some of that, but not for a lot of it. Yeah, I thought it was important that he um, he pointed out that purity and sanctity, you could find manifestations of that both on the right and the left. But, right. you know, the major point he was making in this... Uh, in this little lecture, and by the way, I, I highly recommend it to the blogging ads people. It's only about I don't know what, like eight eight minutes long. Or yeah, ten. it's a nice short short video. And yeah, he's we'll, quite we'll the show. We'll put a link to it. And um, I meant to say that he, 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 this was given a talk given at the TED conference, and the TED stands for Technology Entertainment Design. Yeah, and, it, and they, I think the t name of the talk was something like the real difference between liberals and conservatives. And to, to return to the equalizer metaphor of these five dials are turned into two generally different patterns depending on whether you're more liberal or conservative, right? Yeah, so um, as I said, the, the, the fifth one, purity is sanctity, said you can see this on both the right and the left, but he said in general, liberals are really high on uh, harm and care mm -hmm. and uh, fairness reciprocity Number one and two. Yeah. Number one and two, and conservatives are much higher on in-group loyalty, yeah. uh, authority and respect, right. and purity and sanctity. Yeah. So that yeah, that kind of rings true, and it really, I mean, it really struck a chord with me because I remember having this conversation once with a friend, and we were talking about uh, trying to understand, you know, the difference between Republicans and Democrats or people who were pro-choice and uh, anti-choice and, and um, I should say pro-choice and pro-life <laughs> <laughs> to use each group's own oh George own you're ladies. such a tolerant liberal yeah but uh, <laughs> right, yeah, that's showing my, um, my number two scale being turned up um, yeah and, and then she looked at me and she said yeah it's just like they have different brains Yeah, liberals and conservatives and I thought it's true. I mean, whenever you get into an argument with someone like that, it's like these two completely immiscible world views. You know, you just don't you just butt butt off each other like oil and water. And um, so how and much? And so this kind of fine grains that in a neat way. Yeah. Um, so I'm a little bit, you know, a couple of things bother me about this. First of all, you know, here we are. We're good liberal Democrats. And uh, I think this is sort of, um, you know, th this breakdown is uh, flattering to us, right? <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, and of course we know what side that uh, Jonathan Haidt is on. And yeah, um, and, and so I would like to hear a, uh, you know, a smart conservative, although, you know, is that an oxymoron? Anyway... A conservative intellectual. Sure. You're too high on this. It, yeah, no, no, you turn I'm, down your in-group loyalty dial. Yeah, I know. But, I'm, yeah, I'm, no, I mean, yeah, yeah. So what, what they would say... And it was interesting, too, how we took the, the show of hands at the TED conference to see how many... You, you, you predicted there'd be very few conservatives, and sure enough, and, and his interpretation was because TED conferences were for these people that were interested in diversity and ideas and led a... Um, you know, a thousand flowers bloom, and that this the, and this would tend to attract people with the um, liberal settings on the equalizer more than conservatives. Yeah, and I, I don't know. So, so that part of it, that you know, the idea that hate is probably a secular liberal, um, and has uh, come up with this breakdown of political values that favors secular liberals 
that makes me, yeah. even though I'm a secular liberal, it makes me a little uh, skeptical. Also, some of these things, you know, as I said, I thought it was really good that he pointed out that there's a left version of the uh, purity, um, yeah. sanctity principle that you yeah. see. Yeah, I mean, it seemed a little less skewed. Um. Yeah, and also, you know, in terms of, so on the left, obviously, I remember one of the paradoxes of the 60s is that there was this um, this tremendous pressure when I was a teenager to conform to nonconformity, if you know what oh, I mean. Oh, yeah, right. You know, to sort of show your rebellion by yeah. having your hair a certain length and liking certain yeah. kinds of music and literature and certain political values. And so it was kind of a knee-jerk, in-group... Um, Reaction to another mm -hmm. set of values, but still there yeah, was there yeah. was a tense. Yeah, I, I often regret my like I think back in my college years and a lot of opportunities I wasted because of this um, knee jerk, um, you know, need to to be different and rebellious and eccentric. And yeah, well, that, that's <laughs> probably innate as kind well. Of self conscious, it's, yeah. So. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. And also, you know, obviously, a lot of uh, there are on the right, there are there's nonconformism. So especially if um, if the left is in power, then uh, then um, you know the the people on the right tend to be the uh, the rebels. So you know, it's yeah. I, I'm suspicious also of these. I would put this in the category of um, pop psychology. And you know, it's just yeah. it's a little bit too uh, reductive, and and you start examining it. It's sort of fun to think about, but when you examine it more closely, it um, I think you should be uh, very skeptical. Well, yeah, but I, in general, though, it kind of seems to ring true to me. That uh, I mean, of course, you can argue over you know what the what the scales are, what dials there should be on the equalizer, and. And the different patterns of the settings, but in general, it really, it really rang true to me that there are these. It's almost like these two, basically, fundamentally different tribes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Except and it that. Really, uh, oh, it's really struck me on this drive. You know, I, you know, I live in Santa Fe, which is kind of a, you know, Ob Obama bubble. Right. <laughs> And as soon as I left Santa Fe and got on the highway heading toward uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico, and I started seeing, um, you know, I saw a McCain Palin sign, and I was kind of startled. <laughs> and I realized it was, you know, I hadn't seen a McCain Palin sign, I don't think. And, you know, I mean, I must have seen one in Santa Fe. But And then, of course, I started seeing more and more and more of them. And, and then especially when I was driving back down through the Front Range and, uh, and you know, across the... Uh, this, there's this valley that's kind of between the Front Range and the Sawatch Mountain Range, and down through little towns like uh, Fair Play, <laughs> yeah, and, and Buena Vista, which they pronounce Buena Vista, which really rankles me. But uh, and then looking at all the, you know, and then seeing all the McCain Palin signs, and then I turn, you know, and I had my radio on, and I was just basically hitting the seek switch and going from talk radio station to talk radio station and hearing all the local advertising and uh, and it really it really made me a lot less optimistic that Obama's going to to win next month. Yeah, I I've been uh listening to um ABC radio uh which is yeah. uh 77 WABC in uh New York <laughs> yeah. and it's uh, -huh. uh it's pretty much all right wing talk radio. It's where Sean Hannity is. Imus is yeah. not yeah, Imus is kind of a soft right winger, but he's definitely in McCain's camp. Yeah. So they have Imus in the morning on and um a guy named Bob Grant, who's this really, you know, I find loathsome right wing figure, Rush Limbaugh. And I'm I yeah. I've been listening to them lately to try to knock myself out of my, um, you know, my my sort of uh, stereotypical leftist liberal uh, yeah. thinking, and um, did it it's, work? No, it's just uh, it's no, maybe, yeah. It's de instead, the team thing comes in, right? Like the in group loyalty. It's just they they seem like just nasty, uh, manipulative. Either they're morons in case of some yeah. of the people who are calling in, or um, they're they're these, uh, you know, uh, manipulative. 
uh, bastards like uh, Limbaugh. Yeah. Uh, who are just well, yeah, trying and, to and then you know, of course, these people are doing it professionally, and a yeah. lot of it's just you know they're putting on a show to make money. Yeah. But um, but then you hear the people who call in, and, and this is what really you know struck me. I mean, it's nothing that I didn't know, but well, like for example, you know, I mean, there, there's different ads too that are being put on these radios to appeal to different people, and they're not the ads we hear so much on mainstream TV. Like there was this one, and they had. It was some country western, famous country western singer. I forgot who it was, Merle Haggard or someone like that. Uh-huh. And he was he was talking about, uh, you know, it was a pro McCain commercial, and he was talking about Obama. So um, comment, it's in, that's his famous comment at that. I guess it was a San Francisco rally or meeting or something where he was talking about uh, about um, lower lower middle class Americans in the um, Midwest clinging to their, you know, feeling threatened and endangered and um, therefore clinging to their uh, God, their guns, and or their guns and their religion. Yeah. However he put it, you know, and of course, you know, this, what struck me is a, a very astute analysis. Right. <laughs> and but I'm it sure, cannot be you know, said. It cannot be uh, said. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah you, you're just not allowed to say anything that, you know, you know, it's analytical in which you're expressing an idea. So, of course, then the Democrats had to spin it the other way. But, you know, the Republicans are still seizing on this. So Merrill Haggard was quoting quoting Obama or whoever this country western singer was as saying this and then, you know, just stirring this resentment, you know, saying how he just doesn't get, you know, the importance that we have for our God and for our guns, our guns that our grandfathers gave us. <laughs> and just pulling out all the stops and just dealing, you know, just hitting people in their reptilian brains and it just made me realize what's depressed me so much about this whole campaign, both from the Democrats and from the Republicans. You know, we've just, and it's, you know, gotten this way every election for the last 20 years, I guess. But there's just no more of this sense of, you know, actually discussing ideas well, I think and their merits. It's all just playing to the reptilian brain. And, um, you know, you know, the debates, I think, have just been horrible. Oh, I, well... I guess I'm. I'm. I don't think they've been horrible because I think Obama <laughs> has um, has kicked McCain's ass and. Uh, well, I'm really disappointed in, in Obama, but. Oh, that's too. Oh, well. Yeah, well, let me give you an example. Okay. You know, there's um, like in the second debate, McCain brought up this ridiculous thing about Obama putting one of these evil earmarks in a bill to get money for a. I can't remember how many million dollars for a for a projector. Right. For the uh, Chicago Observatory. Yeah. You know, and Obama just kind of, you know, he, he didn't he didn't respond to that. He just kind of smiles and and goes on to something else. I mean, to me, that's a perfect example of of you know where he could have really seized the moment and redefined the debate and said, well, John, I mean, you know, I mean, he should have been armed with the information. I mean, he at least should have been armed with it when McCain incredibly brought it up again in the next debate. But yeah. Obama could have said, well, John, you know, this is a projector in the Chicago Planetarium, and the Chicago Planetarium is one of the great cultural institutions, not just of my state in the Midwest, but of the country. It's showing kids who come in there, and these are kids also from the south side of Chicago, and showing them the beauty of the universe, getting them interested in science. And to me, I think that's exactly the kind of thing that we should be getting federal money for. Oh, wow, that was eloquent, George. You know, but... But, but you know, you know, you know, but the idea is no, that's not strategically good because I'm ahead a few points in the poll, so that's therefore the I'm just supposed to to dig in, and we're not supposed to discuss ideas, or you know, just whenever you get this anti-tax Yahoo populism from McCain and Palin, you know, the response should be, well, you know, John, whenever I think of taxes, I remember a quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Justice. Oliver Wendell Holmes, the taxes are the price we pay for living in a civilized society. <laughs> and it is patriotic to pay taxes. Jesus, My running George, mate, Joe should, Biden, was correct. You should but, be. You know, the whole. <laughs> you should be a political <laughs> consultant. You are so eloquent. I feel like voting but these for are you. All, these are all ideas. I mean, you know, they, the whole liberal tradition, you know, from, from Franklin Delano Roosevelt has just been completely abandoned, you know, in embarrassment by the Democratic Party. And they're still trying as hard as they can be, they can to squeak in under the radar by seeming as Republican and Yahoo right wing <laughs> as they possibly can. You know, like Hillary Clinton, you know, talking about, you know, 
slugging down boiler makers and then going out hunting. It's just pathetic. Hey, listen, I want to ask you about something. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting off. No, that's that's. Well, I, you, I, I, you know, I'll be glad when this is over and Obama wins too. But I just wanted to ask you about something I, I, really yeah, profound. Yeah. But mm, it, it, I have misgivings about it too. A point that Hate made at the end of his um, lecture, and you can sort of see this coming. But I just wonder what you think of it. So he said, of course, you know, so you've got these innate tendencies and this great divide between people we call liberals and conservatives in this country, and it's led to, um, you know, this great division, blue states, red states, and so forth, and and a lot of hostility across that divide yeah. now. And so he's sort of saying at the end, why can't we all get along? And he's telling these people, primarily liberal in the TED conference, who like to think of themselves as very uh, open-minded, enlightened, and so forth, and seeking progressive change. He's telling them, you have to understand and yeah. empathize more with people on the conservative side, because, yeah. uh, you know... Their reality is, is as real to them as ours is to us. And he said that we need those values... So basically, the the conservative values can be summed up as uh, placing um, order and stability ahead of uh, maybe fairness, yeah. universal fairness and compassion yeah. for the poor and so forth, and that you can't really have one without the other. And what bothers yeah. me is that this is just another liberal value. I actually mentioned this last <laughs> week when right, I was talking right. with uh, David um, Baraby. I mean, I... Oh, yeah, that was really good. Well, David has talked a lot about some of these... Yeah, the uh, us same, versus them, which, same, and, and yes. this is just kind of a, you know, it seems like a, you know, fit, feeds right into that. But it, you know, but, the two different brains. What I said, I sort of blurted out at the end without really explaining it, uh, that why is it the liberals who have to be tolerant? So the problem is... Well, yeah, is, right. Yeah, I, I, I heard you say that. and Well, I mean, it's because uh, we're... <laughs> We're higher on the uh, the number one and the number two scale, so you know we're, we, we're um, all for diversity, even if it's against ideas we find reprehensible. You know, like the ACLU um, going to bat to um, you know defend the right of um, Nazis to you know, march in some parade, whatever that famous incident was. But at some point, we have to draw the line, don't we? I mean, Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I think one thing that, that Hate's paradigm maybe misses, or maybe it's just because he's not interested in this particular question, is how these these two sides vie within each one of us. Yeah. Because I definitely have moments when I, you know, kind of lapse into a more right-wing, right-wing kind of mode. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes liberals will just drive, you know, like certain liberal pieties drive me crazy. And I just, like going to Whole Foods and, you know, right next to the aisle with all the expensive Cabernet Sauvignons. And then on, over here, there's the really super expensive uh, $20 a pound steaks. And then you have the aisle with the macrobiotic medicines and all this complete pseudoscience. And, <laughs> you know. Homeopathy. <laughs> yeah. It just makes me cringe, are these people. You know, this whole idea of, how you know it's supposed to be really great to buy your cereal out of some bin and you know scoop it into a bag because it reminds <laughs> them of their their pathetic little college co-ops. Oh, George, you're such a crank. You know. Yeah, so 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 that's see that's my conservative you know great you know tradition and you know you have to have respect for General Mills and all these companies that. <laughs> Well, that's your that's <laughs> your in boxes. That's your respect for scientific authority too, which is part of part of your persona as a science writer and one of the points that David Barbie uh, made is that you you know he said that he originally decided to write his book because he was tired of some of these uh, dualistic ways of of uh, dividing yeah. people you know sort of free market capitalists versus communists and or yeah. you know red state blue state people and he said that you know we all have multiple identities and that our um, Responses to different situations are much more complex than most of these models account for. But the, the thing mm -hmm. about tolerance that bothers me is if you're just trying to think about sort of a um, you know a, a, a political system that will really work over the long haul, uh, 
my there, there's an asymmetry in the way that tolerance works. So let's say um, I am tolerant in such a way that I allow a, uh, a fundamentalist group, an uh, evangelical fundamentalist group, to um, thrive, even though they are not tolerant back toward me. They think that their yeah. value system is absolute, and so they will try yeah. to impose their values on me. Now, if they are content to have their own little commune or whatever and uh, practice their absolute value system within that and not bother me, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But some of yeah. these non-tolerant ideologies are very aggressive and are going out and trying to convert other people. Well, yeah, so, so they, force. yeah, so it's uh, yeah, it's a paradox. I mean, in the in the great marketplace of ideas, um, you're supposed to encourage people whose goal is to shut down the marketplace of ideas, right? And impose some kind of totalitarian. Yeah. So there's there's a this weird self undermining quality to tolerance. It's actually similar to skepticism. So skepticism and tolerance are both sort of meta values that that are sort of weirdly self contradicting or self yeah. um, undermining. Um, yeah, because I mean they're, they're based on this assumption that um, there's many different ways of um, viewing and understanding reality and uh, and yet, you know, you have to believe that um, the way <laughs> The, the general, you know, liber, liberal liberality or liberalness in its most basic definition of just, you know, believing in, you know, the flourishing of lots of different competing ideas. I mean, if you believe that that's just one of the competing ideas, you know, that might be right or might be wrong, <laughs> then the whole thing falls apart. So, right. Well, yeah. it, I mean, I certainly, I. So we all have our different meta levels. Yeah. I mean, the two different groups have a diff different meta beliefs and. And we don't compromise our meta beliefs, but we're willing to let uh, beliefs on this next lower level flourish. And I mean, I just think that as a as a liberal progressive, there are certain values that you believe are absolute. So uh, you know, yeah. slavery was wrong. We all agree on that now. Wait, wait, what? What was wrong? S slavery. Oh, slavery, slavery. Even yeah. though there yeah. are certain, you know, there's certainly certainly quasi slavery around the world nowadays, but, you know, pretty much everybody around the world says that slavery is wrong. Um, right. Women's yeah, rights... And some things, you know, in, in astrology is not true. Right. Creationism is not uh, an equally good way to, an uh, equally valid way to uh, uh, explain the development of life on Earth. But the Bible is not the inerrant word of God. Right. Yeah, yeah, so... Well, and, that, and that all kind of feeds treating. into... You know, someone wrote a book about this recently, but it's an old idea, but I just read a review. Um, you know, this notion that secular humanism is just another religion. Oh, well, is it John you know, It has Gray? its own core set of values, so everything that we're talking about, and including hates, um, hates um, five five level scale of morality, this is all embedded within this more general view of you know secular humanistic world view where there are competing ideas and that um, you have the secular background. So we kind of think of the secular background as being this neutral canvas right? You know, in which we paint our ideas while to someone who's um, um, a religious believer of you know whatever stripe, they see secular humanism as being like a competing religion or at least a competing philosophy. This sounds like um, John Gray, a British philosopher whom David Barbie and I oh, discussed yeah, a little bit about him. last week. So he's got these two recent books, uh, Black Mass and Straw Dogs, that both yeah. uh, portray secular humanism as just, as you said, just a yeah, uh, that's another the, ideology. That's, that's where I got that in my head. It was from watching your, your dialogue oh, with David okay. Barabee. And it reminded me of, you know, the very first book that I wrote was called Architects of Fear. Yes. Conspiracy Theories and Paranoia yeah. in American Politics. And I kind of got into that, you know, those issues way back then when I probably wasn't, you know, wasn't an accomplished enough writer to do them complete justice. But, and, you know, and it started with, you know, like during the... Um, you know, early in American history, the Jeffersonians versus the Hamiltonians, and the Hamiltonians would accuse the Jeffersonians of being in the grip of these uh, this uh, evil French 
Enlightenment ideas, and uh, you know, France was kind of to the United States then what the Soviet Union would become later, the evil evil empire of secular ideas and anti-religion, and and uh, you know, so again, you had those two different kinds of brains, and you could probably fit the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians and different fittings on Jonathan Haidt's scale. But it also manifests itself in, in conspiracy theories. So like the Hamiltonians thought the Jeffersonians were not only embracing these liberal philosophies and, you know, Locke and Hume and, and uh, even worse, uh, Rousseau. <laughs> but um, they also thought that this was part of a conspiracy that was hatched by the Freemasons and the Illuminati to basically take over the new fledgling American Republic and that the uh, Freemasonic lodges were being used as hotbeds to discuss these dangerous French ideas. And and it's basically what we now would call secular humanism, but secular humanism won, so (laughs) the conspiracy succeeded. Well, I think what what, um, the problem that Gray has with the Enlightenment and secular humanism is... isn't so much the ideas in themselves, but how they were manifested in the real world. And so with the uh, French Revolution, uh, you know, that led to the terror. So yeah. these ideas to be implemented required uh, slaughtering those who uh, disagreed or who were part of the, yeah. the old regime. didn't require it, but, yeah, that's what happened. I mean, that's just, that's, it just became, uh, you know, once these ideas become... Uh, part of a power struggle, then they can become lethal. And so in that sense, Gray is, say, mm. is saying uh, there was yeah. a lot of similarity between um, between secular, li- secular humanism crusade. and, you know, it's supposed to be more rational, but it still leads to these these uh, cataclysms. I mean, you know, yeah. what happened to the Soviet yeah. Union, what happened with, um, with uh, the Nazis, they thought that they were very enlightened. Uh, yeah. State originally, yeah. and you know, scientifically organized. Uh, so is so he basically, you know, just call, talking about, you know, it's a complete relativism where we're not supposed to believe no. that, you know, despite these abuses, that secular humanism and the, its basic tenets aren't, you know, actually right and true. I don't. He's. I, mean, I don't think he's Everything has saying... to be viewed. I mean, yeah, you can see why this would drive a fundamentalist Christian or or Muslim crazy because we're saying that. Uh, our basic philosophy, of, you know, secularism, and and um, you know that this is the background in which you know we have to explain and understand you know your curious you know religion right. and your strange little thoughts. This is all has to be done within this framework that we're establishing. And they're saying, no, we need to turn this inside out. And the framework is that God created. Um, Created the universe and you know gave his only begotten son, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that we have to understand your weird beliefs within that context is I, basically I, sin. I don't think Gray is not a real relativist. He's just talking yeah. about how how ideas play out in the world, and he's yeah. just saying it's just an empirical fact that um, that this that the Enlightenment has not led to the fading away of religion, that we still have yeah. all these apocalyptic religions, and there's an apocalyptic right. uh, sort of uh, messianic uh, uh, utopian quality to secular humanism as well, and you can see yeah. that in uh, Iraq, although you know the U.S. invasion of Iraq was complicated by the Christianity of, uh, of George Bush, and uh, you know, so, so to say it's sort of uh, secular humanism and free market capitalism imposing itself on another society, it, that's not necessarily... It no, gets a little complicated. Yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but he's just that's saying... That's true. It's, it, it's much more... Yeah, it muddies it up. So he's just saying the, you know, it's sort of the human impulse toward, toward social self-improvement uh, constantly leads to um, catastrophe. And that's yeah. fine. Yeah, we can see that in history, but I, th- I think that still there are genuine positive trends in human history, such as the eradication of slavery, um, the gradual advance in human rights. I mean, the fact that if you just look at this country over the last cent- a century ago, um, women still didn't have the right to vote. I mean, I don't see how you mm. can say that that is, uh, it isn't a tremendous... 
advance in yeah. uh, human social organization. And yeah. I, you know, maybe it can go backwards, but I really doubt that it will. I think it's more that we're sort of one step forward, two steps back, three steps mm-hmm. forward, and um, uh, I, you know, I just think that there is that there is th- that the secular uh, approach, the focus on human rights, it will be self-evidently superior to others mm-hmm. and um, will yeah, wipe well, this out... this is kind of <laughs> Francis Fukuyama's argument, right, in the end of history, that it's just natural that, you know, the world will eventually, and he thought it was happening a lot sooner than it did, I think, yes. that, we, that we'd move towards um, this, this idea of liberal democracies and Again, using liberal, you know, in the way he's using it, uh, you know, John McCain and Sarah Palin are, you know, pretty liberal. <laughs> yeah, liberal I mean, just this basic idea of, you know, secularism, marketplace of ideas that, uh, you know, as opposed to some kind of religious received wisdom. And right. But then, yeah. you know, but so then so grace. You think that's probably, that. yeah, I guess sometimes I'm optimistic about that, but then you see this, you know, these huge backlashes. And there has been a a rollback in democracy around the world just over the past three or four years apparently which is a little depressing but still there's been an increase in the number of democracies around the world and of course you know yeah. it depends on how you define them from yeah, and what you count as a democracy from but... about 20 after World War II to about 100 today so yeah. I, I see that as um, another another uh, good sign uh, but I tell you if John McCain gets elected that will be a big setback for the progress of the human race. Yeah, do you, th- you think? Wow. <laughs> yeah, I do. I don't know. I don't think it'll. I don't think it would, would be that bad. But uh, be, I know. Well, I'm exaggerating. In so many ways, he's you know he's just playing on these you know these primal fears and this you know people's you know inherent need for authority in the sense that someone's going to come take control and playing on this revulsion that. Uh, you know, religious people feel for this, you know, being viewed as, you know, these quaint, you know, these kind of quaint throwbacks by by uh, liberals and secular humanists. So he's kind of playing on that, you know, very cynically to, you know, get these people to vote for him. But, you know, I doubt that he would, you know, it's not going to be like Bush right. by any means. But Well, I just think that, um, you know, our relations with the rest of the world... Um, could really use a boost, and uh, McCain's oh, I election I mean, would yeah. not would not serve that well. Well, I hope that that's you know what Obama is doing also is he's playing to you know the reptilian brain and his campaign mostly, and just not really talking about ideas and things that he really believes. And when he gets in, he'll you know be more like FDR. But I don't know. I was listening to you know while I was just in the last part of my trip back home yesterday, I was coming down the. Down through Taos Canyon, and listening to um, some some public radio show I'd never heard before. It wasn't you know one of the main public radio networks, but they were interviewing um, a, a real a, a real honest to God socialist. <laughs> he described himself as an aging socialist, and I forget his name. He'd written some books and essays, and he was just saying, you know, how much it you know made him cringe when he heard Palin. Or McCain referred to uh, Barack Obama as a dangerous liberal, and he said, on, on you know, from his point of view, on a liberal to conservative scale, he was a lot closer to Richard Nixon than he was to say FDR, and to certainly to anyone who was a socialist, and and how there was nothing. One thing they were asking them, you know, people were saying that you know this is socialism, having the government put uh, all these hundreds of billions of dollars into bailing out the banks and these things, and he was saying. You know, no, it's not socialism, which is too bad. If it were socialism, we would be, you know, getting voting shares and not just, you know, I, th- I guess now we're getting like preferred stock in some of these companies. We say we actually could be controlling them, and and the government would use its control of these companies to set policies, like say, look, you do have to give more loans to people in, you know, these circumstances who you know need help buying houses, or you're not going to give loans and, and finance bonds or underwrite uh, these projects by these corporations that are sending jobs overseas that you'll basically have an agenda and say, look, haha, now we're in control and we have leverage over your company and we're going to use it to have um, you know, impose social 
control and uh, goals that are good for society as a whole, and it's not going to be so good for your profits, but obviously you know, we have to make sure you get a decent profit and can still <coughs> live well so we can keep you know, improving society. That would be socialism, and I that's just, not going to happen. I just saw um, another uh, a Blogging Heads regular, I think his name is David Korn. Um, oh, yeah. He's a liberal counterpart to Pinkerton. And he was yeah, on MSNBC. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. And he was on MSNBC last night, and uh, um, and he pointed out that Sarah Palin uh, has overseen by far the most socialist government of any state in the union. There is mm-hmm. a massive redistribution of wealth program <laughs> at play that she has encouraged and uh, amplified um, under her uh, regime taking uh, the profits of the oil companies and um, distributing them to all the citizens of, um, yeah, of right. Alaska. Right, which, right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so, yeah. So, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, it's, that, that's been in place long before she was governor. But, but, but she is, she is, um, I, I think, got taken an even bigger cut of the profits yeah, from, um, yeah. from the oil companies than uh, was in place yeah. before. So the idea that you know this is socialism, yeah, and it's something yeah. that she's been practicing very aggressively on her own. So the idea that you know, for her to be so accusing Barack Obama of socialism because he wants to have a slightly more progressive tax than what's in place now yeah. is just oh my god is I mean it makes me feel as you do about how idiotic this whole uh, election yeah. is yeah but, yeah um, and again the response from the Democrats should be yeah redistributing <laughs> redistributing wealth is a good thing it's the whole basis of our progressive income tax yeah and, and you know Medicaid yeah, which comes from FDR that uh, you know you don't we're not saying that you know it's not like in Doctor Zhivago where he comes home to the family estate and finds that the Communist Party has taken it over and says, you know, there were living spaces for four or five different families here in your house, and, you know, they've installed the families. Right. (laughs) You know, they can say, this is not what redistributing wealth is. It's just saying that if you're really doing well in society and making a lot of money, you know, you recognize that it's to your benefit to distribute some of this, if nothing else is a cynical way to control the poor. You know, it's to your interest not for there not to be an uprising, a revolution. <laughs> and if it's not going to be a revolution, at least it's, you know, to your advantage that uh, you have less crime and robbery and murders because people on the lower level, you know, can be sure of having a certain minimal standard of life. So, of course, redistributing the wealth is a good thing. But instead, you know, they just react to it on kind of terms that are being set by the Republicans. They, they, they just define the framework. They stick to the talking points. Yeah, um, it's just hey, depressing. Hey, um... Well, just, yeah, we've gotten way off. <laughs> I wanted to bring up one other uh, thing before yeah. we uh, break today. We, we've been meaning to talk about this for a while, but I thought this is something we should talk about before the election. And um, the original uh, news peg was Bob Woodward's... Um, latest book, which was called... What, what the hell was his book called? It, um, it's, it's basically about how everything... Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Oh, The War Within. The Secret White War House Within, History. Yeah. Uh, 2006 to 2008. And um, in it, uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, newsworthy uh, components of the book was that um, the Pentagon has some kind of secret program that... Um, enabled them to uh, target and kill leaders of the insurgency in uh, Iraq uh, with great efficiency and yeah. that this as much as the, the whole surge uh, was responsible for um, the uh, suppression of, uh, of violence over the last yeah. Now, now, did he? Did, when I read about this, his book hadn't come out yet, and it was just one of his famous teasers that he put out, and then refused to elaborate. And well, he so still refused to buy his book. But does he get into any detail in the book, or is it no? Still, uh, it, it was, you know, it's very hush hush. He, he makes it sound. Yeah. As, uh, he has to he, protect his sources. Yeah, he basically says it's it's highly classified, and then he's been on um, some talk shows, and and ba- and you know, makes it sound as though, oh man, I I'd love to tell you because it's 
mind-boggling. It's just really amazing <laughs> thing. But um, so maybe know. by his next book, he'll be able to he'll be able to break the story. But uh, but I guess the, the the image that you know that you know what you kind of infer from this is maybe it's like could even be like satellite tracking, and everyone has a certain signature. You know whether it's um, you know just the way they walk, or maybe not satellite tracking, but you could imagine that you could use airplanes or satellites and just get this data stream and it would include um, you know the, everyone has a different gait a way of walking different patterns of movements and, and if you zoomed in closer different odors and, and you know mix of molecules that they're they're spewing out into the air and that somehow you could use this with complex pattern matching algorithms to track someone wherever they go yeah I there were there's been a bunch of speculation about what it, it, it could be. So thermal signatures, possibly, and it wouldn't wouldn't have thermal to be satellites. Signatures. It could be um, it could be drones. But I remember I did a story yeah. for Scientific American about 20 years ago on remote microwave sensing, basically using radar to detect yeah. human heartbeats through mm. walls. So this was something that could be used for different um, heartbeats. Yeah, a, co- a combination of what your heartbeat is and your thermal signature, and you know the way you you walk, and and maybe your your brain waves, the patterns of your electroencephalographic waves from your. I mean, th- this could all together be processed by some kind of algorithm, and then this would be you. And then you send in, I don't know, maybe some little model airplane with explosives on it to you know. Blow up the guy, but the, but yeah, the technology. Yeah, or, or, or hit them with a niobium, a, a tiny little niobium bullet from an umbrella tip. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, actually, another clever idea that somebody came up with here was that uh, it was you just put a um, a um, uh, transponder, a little chip in uh, munitions, and uh, you could just leave these explosives lying around Baghdad. And then the bad guys would um, mm, would pick yeah. them up, and you know they would think, "Oh, this is great. We can use this in a roadside bomb." And then yeah. you could you could track it and see that somebody had found it, and uh, maybe uh, wait for them to go to some place that you know is uh, uh, is where the terrorists uh, gather, and then uh, and then you can blow it up. So the transponder yeah. is also hooked to some kind of fuse device. Which is yeah, so you don't get so you don't get innocent bystanders. I yeah. mean, it could just be like a mouse electronic mouse trap. It would identify the signature and then. Yeah. But maybe instead of blowing them up, it could send some kind of little little tiny tiny dart with with a, some poison on it. Or but then, so then <laughs> somebody in that uh, really sick. Somebody. Oh wait, in I have a, an idea. Uh, wait, wait, this could be used. You know, this huge problem that the Republicans are so worried about with Acorn. Supposedly uh, registering all these voters who, you know, are illegitimate. You know, they're just making this huge, huge thing out of what's probably, probably nothing. But you know, this is how you could, you know, we could have our voting machines identify you by these these very various signatures when you come into the polls. And uh-huh. That's a good idea. I'm telling you, George. I think yeah. you uh, have a future as a political consultant. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I I just wanted to uh, mention. Uh, one other suggestion. This was in uh, the Star. And I pulled this off some website. Speculate. Oh, the Toronto Star speculating about mm-hmm. um, what this Woodward uh, secret weapon was. And mm-hmm. uh, this woman, Linda Hurst, suggested that it could be a voice of God device that makes someone think they're listening to the Almighty. So oh. th- this is a um, this is an idea that's been around for a while. I think. One of the inspirations is this guy, Michael Persinger, a Canadian scientist who invented the God machine, which stimulates... Oh, right. Yeah, we've talked about that. Yeah. You actually... You know, doesn't you work. Wore, you, you, you wore the God helmet, right? Yeah, I wore the God helmet, and, and it yeah, doesn't work. you didn't, didn't but it's, hear a thing. But it's conceivable, and this I, this idea has gotten a lot of circulation in, in uh, the whole conspiracy, uh, sort of high-tech conspiracy theory um, movement out there, and it's sort of made its rounds through... the the internet, and um, and I was just wondering, you know, if the Republicans got a hold of this, and of course they they have it, if the Pentagon does, um, <laughs> think of what this might mean for 
elections. What if they use the voice of God device to tell us mm. to vote for John McCain and all the other Republicans in the upcoming ah. election? So this could be behind these, you know, these uh, recent change in polling numbers where McCain's edging up a little bit. I don't know. Maybe it could even be yeah. behind um, some of these um, problems that you have with Barack Obama, George. You might wow. be uh, being exposed wow. to the voice of God yeah. machine yeah. as we speak. Yeah. Or wow. not. Well, how do we know the candidates aren't being manipulated this way? Well, that's a problem, and too. Manchurian candidates. Yeah. Yeah, so Obama himself. Well, you know... Now, maybe people are going to think we're just absolutely crazy. You know, so this is kind of... <laughs> I mean, we're, you know, we're kidding, right? Oh, oh, you mean we're in danger of losing our credibility, George? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, oh, no! Well, you know, the stakes are pretty low here, so... Okay, I'm not going to worry about it. But it's, uh, you know, it's fun to work yourself up into paranoid frenzies sometimes. <laughs> I love that, the voice of God device. Yeah, yeah, so, so basically... I, it would uh, make you feel compelled to do things because you're, you know, feel because you're getting the authority from on high. Yeah, it sort of it sends a beam of electromagnetic radiation at your brain and and uh, tickles your you know God module and your politics module in such a way that yeah. uh, you know you think God has ordered you to vote for uh, Sarah Palin and John McCain. <laughs> Well, if this is what Woodward's talking about and they have it, you know, in Pakistan, it's not really working. <laughs> no. It doesn't seem like. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the well, thing. I bet, it's the, I bet it's the tracking thing. Yeah, it might be that. That sounds, or, that sounds more plausible. And some people have said it. Actually, Woodward, I mean, he's such a... He's such a... Ugh, guy, I don't know. That guy, I can't stand him. <laughs> Someday in history it will be described... To people's amazement, he compares it to the top secret Manhattan Project, but he says it's even really? more astonishing than that. And he mm -hmm. says, the enemy has a heads up now because they've been getting wiped out and a lot of them have been killed. It's not news to them. It's a wonderful example of a, example of American ingenuity solving a, prop, a problem in war. But then he can't, he can't say what it is, and then he says the reason he can't say it is because people will be killed if he reveals what it is. But, of course, the whole point yeah. of it is to kill people. But I guess he means <laughs> the wrong people. Yeah. It's very confusing. Yeah. Well, you'd think, <laughs> you think that as an editor at the Washington Post, you'd feel some sort of journalistic obligation to to pursue this, but maybe not. I mean, if it's if he's really comparing it to the Manhattan Project, where you know, there was a certain amount of you know, conspir conspiring with the press to you know, put a lid on the story until they were safe to release it. One of the greatest delusions of all is that um, a technological advantage can solve some of these huge political problems out there. Yeah. Or, uh, well, I guess know. I hope he's right, and they can, you know, wind this thing up. Yeah. All right, man. Wow, that was a real, yeah, I, I, that was all over the place, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and... You know, I, I really needed to get some of this stuff out. Yeah, I think we both did. It's, <laughs> it's a good thing this So you're, you're heading off on, on some interesting trip that I'm sure we'll talk about when you get back. Yeah, the Singularity Summit. I'm going to actually debate Ray <laughs> Kurzweil there. So that should be wow. fun. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about... He's the guy who says we're all going to turn into computers or robots or... Well, yeah, just what we've been talking about. Just <laughs> another a different context. Yeah. So, are you going to be speaking at this, or just are, are writing about it? Uh, no, I'm actually uh, at the very end. I uh, I'm part of a. Uh, actually, I thought it was going to be a panel, but now apparently it's just going to be a dialogue between me and Ray Kurzweil. Oh wow! So it should be fun. Wow. So uh, yeah, we'll talk about that when you get back. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's good, John, so uh, hang in there, and I hope you, you survive Susie's absence. Oh, I'll be all right. And, Sounds uh, a great thing she's doing. Yeah, and try to feel better about Obama, okay? I will. I mean, you know, I'm certainly going to vote for him. Oh, but, good. Uh, I guess we're not supposed to say who we're voting for since we're journalists, but... Uh, <laughs> Fuck that. What the hell? Yeah, we're, sci <laughs> yeah, we're science writers. Yeah, <laughs> we're not real journalists. <laughs> <laughs> we're all certainly right. not political journalists. So. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Good See to you. talk to you, John. Bye, man.